This is Breaking Down Security, and I am Brian Brake. Welcome back, listener. This is Brian, Miss Berlin, and Mr. Betcher for Breaking Down Security. Hello. Hi. Yeah. So how was everybody's weekend? It was a three-day weekend. Yes. That's how. Yes, for us uh, U.S. Americans, it was uh, Memorial Day weekend. So. Right. Yes. Yes. I uh, I, I beta tested our camping equipment because uh, we did we waited too long to actually get a campsite, so we're gonna go camping next weekend. But uh, it was nice. Uh, it was like eighty degrees all weekend up here in Seattle. So. Probably better anyway. You don't want to follow the herd. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's why I go camping in July. I mean, so not July, January. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely not following her. You freeze your ass off. Um, yeah, it's complete 180. Nobody's there. Yeah, nobody's there. It's complete 180 uh, today. Uh, we had 80 degrees and sunny, and now it's like we barely got into 70 today, and it's rainy and cloudy. So that's that's how Seattle is. So Yeah, we had a lot of rain. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. Yeah, it's it's weird weird weather this year. The the spring has been very mild up here. So, um, <clears throat> all right. Well, I'm I'm going to go ahead and bring our our guest on because uh, I w- I want to talk to her and pick her brain. She's somebody I've been following on Twitter probably for as long as she's been on Twitter, uh, or as long as I've been on Twitter, and that's since 2009. So, um, she goes by Jesse Soros Rex on uh, Twitter and. Uh, Welcome, Miss um, Jesse Irwin, to the show. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I have a lot of feelings and opinions, so I'm I'm very excited <laughs> to work through our little joint group therapy session here. Yeah, very. Cool. We're, we're glad to be here for you. Do we need to have <laughs> a, Do we need to have a disclaimer? The feelings and much feels expressed are not necessarily the medical advice feels of our companies <laughs> or whatever. Right. No, um, no. Everybody knows I have these feelings. It's not a surprise. Feelings. Well, you said something about working on no, your upper no register. Singing. Are you going to sing? No, probably not. But when I get ranty, I have to. I have to get up there in the in the right space. So. All right. So on your Twitter, it says you're the lady geek in the streets. Sign bunnies in my tweets. Security empress taco. Va- oh, taco evangelist. Have you been to Austin? Right? Have you been to Austin? I have. I have. I've eaten a lot of tacos there. Taco deli. I was, I was not upset about any of the tacos that I ate. I was, um, I was speaking. I had to go for South by one year and trying uh-huh. to get tacos during South by is like not it. No, just no. But I went um, in April of last year for a conference in Posex Southwest. Mm-hmm. And I remember hanging out downtown at night and it was like two in the morning and there was a taco truck and it was probably a very good life decision. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I uh, plan on maybe hitting uh, B-Sides Austin uh, or uh, one of the d conferences down there next year. I need to hit up with my friend, Mr. Betcher, and go back to Taco Deli and and, and uh, Torchies. So uh, Torchies is the bomb. Yeah. Torchies, yeah. Yes, the crack taco capital of the world, yes, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So. Oh, there was this great article. I, it made me feel like I made the wrong decisions in my life. But there was a reporter who ate nothing but tacos for a year for every what? meal. Yes, what? Yes. It was, it was a food um reporter like a food critic and it's like the third or fourth time he's done nothing but eat tacos for a year and I kind of feel like this is this is like one of my people but maybe I could do a few months of tacos I, I feel like you should not a full year in your job <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 I, I feel like I need to become the expert in like taco security yep. yes but it's- on the on the red team side, so I can eat all the tacos when I like social engineer them out of whatever. Austin is weird like that with the the tacos. It's like I when I first moved there, I was like, oh yeah, I went to this one place, and they're like, yeah, that that place sucks. You don't want that place for tacos. I'm like, are you kidding me? That was good. Oh no, 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 it's crap, it's crap. And Kalachis is the other one. It's like, don't go to that place for kolaches. I'm like, what? Well, it was a good one. No, no, it's not. It's not. Yeah, that's like, I'm like that's how do like you know people... what's your basis of comparison? That's like when people tell me that like Chipotle has disgusting tacos or, you know, Taco Bell is the worst. I think that tacos are just amazing in whatever form they come in and there's a right place and a right time. 
So some days you have to have your emergency Chipotle taco because it's reliable and you know there's going to be steak in it. And right. other days you want to be terrible and you're going to eat those Taco Bell things with the nacho cheese and you're just never going to talk about what happened afterwards again. Like that's right. that's how it goes. The taco walk so, of shame is what you're trying to say? Yeah. I just, just I always just, feel like death after you eat it. <laughs> I just don't get all the taco snark and like the general... The general like food snobbiness. It's all good. It's all made out of delicious animals. Just like don't hurt. Just appreciate. Love it. That's right. <clears throat> so um, we we went a bit far afield with. Well, we tried to bring taco security in, but uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, so before we get on our topic, uh, people who don't know who you are, maybe you could tell us a little bit about who you are, and, and other than the fact you're a taco evangelist, uh, and how well, you got I mean, to be an infosec. Sure. So I first started working in technology seven or eight years ago. um, And I started out in the marketing and the communication side of the house. Um, A long time ago, when I was in college, I realized that I really love technology, even though I studied the liberal arts stuff. Um, I was an art history major. And maybe there might be some room for an art history major in the middle of all of all of this Silicon Valley technology business. The easiest way to get in and to start exploring uh, was on the marketing and communication side. But I'd say probably well before that, when I was in college, I had an interest in security. It didn't start out necessarily as networks and code and things like that. It was really the people side. And after being on the communications team long enough and always bringing up like, hey, what are we doing on the security side? How are we going to avoid getting a bad press cycle? What is our development team doing? Do they even sandbox bro? Um, After asking enough questions, I got myself in enough trouble to really specialize in the security side of communications. And I jumped over to being on a security team when I was at 1Password, yelling at everyone not to use Monkey or reuse their passwords. Mm -hmm. But it, it really started with me being interested in something and finding my own way through the skills that I value about myself um, and making room for it. Because any other uh, person who went to Virginia Tech with me probably would have been a computer science major and probably would have, you know, worked for a big tech company. And I didn't start that way. I was in startups who had to make these really important business critical security and privacy decisions. And I got to have a voice in the table when I could at least say like, this is a place where the economics of that decision for our business are going to make us lose business because customers won't like it, or they're going to give us a bad press cycle. And that's going to cost us for a long time. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. So the genesis of this whole uh, meetup here that we've got our, our podcast this week came from a tweet where she says security training is more than a fishing program security training is more than a fishing program she has a mantra that she was speaking and she added the dark reading room article about the fact that cybersecurity training is non-existent at one third of small or medium businesses and um so we started talking and i reached out to her and i said hey that's very interesting we should probably have you on and discuss and she said uh no i'm sorry i can't come on i'm going to give a keynote in south africa and i can't make it and i was like well that sounds like a fairly decent excuse <laughs> <laughs> it's better than most you know it's not like i'm going to be going to the grand canyon next week to hike so uh, uh you know uh. yeah yeah lame yeah that's lame. a lame excuse in it. yeah yeah so um <laughs> she she told me there was about 10 things that they should be teaching in corporate security training that that misses the mark so we were going to go through some of those and discuss in addition to the to the dark reading article um so the one thing we, I did have an issue about the dark reading article was at the very bottom, it's basically uh, a company touting their education track, which seems to me that there was a bit of weight involved with that article. Yeah, so that's always a problem for me. You tend to see these articles pop up in some of our, our industry, like trade rags, where you see this perfectly constructed problem that only their product can solve. Mm. It gets annoying. You tend to see a lot of um, these data-driven posts where someone will have a Twitter argument that turns into a poll or they will go and email all of their customers who already have their own bias behind them and then pitch all of these not exactly well-researched ideas out into the universe. And then we suddenly kind of all take them as a commandment or like a thing written in stone. Um, That's, 
I, I don't love seeing that. And also this one really got on me because I've done a significant amount of work with smaller businesses and I kind of wanted to just smack the person who thought this was a good idea because the economics for getting security training, think about this, security training where you hire a person who does nothing but send out the emails and write the policy and that stuff, that's not actually a position that most small businesses are going to be able to afford unless they're in a very specific space in the market like healthcare or they're in a spot where they're a technology company and they have to comply with things. That's not something your average, you know, 10 person business in the middle of Iowa is going to think, yes, we need security training for all of our wait staff and our small business. And you know, that's half an Etsy store, e-commerce, whatever. It, it just doesn't work like that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, that sounds like a position that mm, I've never actually heard at a company anyway. Most people are now outsourcing their, their LMS systems to third parties that, you know, because they don't have time to make their own content or whatever. So, I mean, we are looking uh, at a previous company that I was at. We were looking at getting an LMS up and, you know, they basically all suck. They were all security based training, click, 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 five questions and you're done. And you could always take them over if you didn't pass the exam until you got a hundred percent. And they were flash based, which everybody, you know, was laughing about the fact we had to install flash to make it work. But, and nobody really learned anything. There was really nothing gained by doing that. It was, you know, oh, don't click on emails. Okay, done. I didn't even bother reading the, the, the slides. I would just skip to the end and do the questions um, and would pass, obviously. Um, so, I mean, what what is it the whole training industry that's broken or is it just certain facets of it? I think it's a... I think it goes back to the demands that security teams are facing within their organizations. If you have enough resources to hire a security person to do nothing but awareness, that's awesome. It's best when things are done in house and you understand the culture of the business and you can have a really, really good idea of specific threats that awareness can actually solve um, within your organization. Mm -hmm. I think what we tend to see though, is it's cheaper to outsource it. And we might agree with, you know, two thirds or three quarters of the curriculum, but it's not necessarily presented in an interesting way that you know that your employees might enjoy or might pay attention to. Um, I've gotten, I wouldn't call it a fight because I was watching the video and it couldn't hear me, but I've gotten in fights with some of the awareness videos because they give the most ridiculous password advice that you you could ever imagine. I, I can't imagine any corporate security person sitting back and thinking any of these things are a good idea. Um, and yet people buy the videos. And I think part of it really is there's a checkbox in a lot of industries that say you have to go through training. If you have one training person and you have 10,000 people you have to educate, you do have to offload some of that to course curriculum. But the curriculum right now just it's boring and it really stinks. And it, it really shows you that a lot of the assumptions we've made about how people learn and then we've baked into technology are just fundamentally wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, but how, you know, how people learn, but, but what are we teaching them as well? I mean, we think that by teaching people certain things that we'll get the results that we want. However, that's not necessarily the case. And even though it, it makes sense to us at the time that surely this is going to work, we don't put any science behind it. We don't do any studies as to whether or not this particular um, technique will work or this idea will work uh, in the masses. I mean, we have good feelings about it, but in reality, and I'll give you an example, there was a show in the 80s called uh, Scared Straight mm. where they would take these at-risk kids and um, haul them into the prisons and say, hey, this, you know, if you keep acting like this, this is what your life is going to be like. You're going to live in this prison for 30 years and you'll have to answer to these guards and it sucks and you'll just have, this is your home for the next 30 years or, or longer if you continue on this path. And everybody was like, you know, oh man, these kids are going to, you know, this has got to have an impact on their lives because now they're actually seeing what could result from their behavior. And so there was a, there was a behavioral uh, scientist, a statistician who actually said, you know what, I wonder if that actually worked, you know? And so he took 
a baseline, kids that were um, acting the same. And then mm -hmm. he took the actual kids that were in the show. And it turns out that what we thought would happen was actually the opposite of what actually happened. These kids were more likely to end up in prison uh, for whatever reason. I guess speculating that, um, you know, since they knew what prison actually was about. Um, they thought that, you know, since I've been there and these guys were, you know, they were human beings too, and they actually lived there and they could lift weights and they got meals. They, they kind of felt comfortable with the idea, right? So um, going back to the security awareness thing, you know, maybe what we are actually trying to teach might have the opposite effect if we don't do the, the proper studies on their effects. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, most people that I know working in security awareness are not the first people who are going to go and poke around soups or poke around some of the conferences that investigate how human beings actually feel about privacy or feel about security and then figure out how to tailor that to their own work internally. Um, I also think that it's really frustrating too because a lot of the things that we end up teaching people, like we tell people, my favorite thing to fuss about is passwords. I'll always be fussing about passwords. They're just never going to die. If I had a dollar for everyone, every person who told me that passwords were dead, I would never have to work again. But we tell people all of this stuff and we forget to at least tell them, hey, by the way, there's an easier way to do it instead of coming up with this word that's like not really a word. It's got letters and numbers and like, I don't know, the name of your first grade crush and like the name of the dog that you love the most before like your parents split up or whatever. We put all this shit into passwords. We don't actually tell people, hey, you can just go generate passwords in a password manager. Like there are other ways to do this that don't involve memorizing 253 separate credentials um, every single day and spreading them out. And I think a lot of awareness education comes through policy documents and it comes through these online learning platforms. But we could just say, hey, like there's a whole bunch of security crap that it's gonna be really hard for you if we made you pay attention and, and learn how to be an expert the way that we are. So we're just gonna tell you how to navigate through that stuff period. Here are your basic rules. Here are your basic strategies. If you're confused, email the team. We'll help you out, but you know, go and then see what happens instead of giving people, you know, a hundred commandments and 23 different situations and threats that they have to know how to navigate through. Like I would rather tell someone, go use a password manager and set up two factor authentication instead of make them literally become an expert and identifying whether a link in an email is real or false. That's not their job. Exactly. You know? and yeah. your job. When we turn everyone into, you know, someone who has to authenticate whether <clears throat> something is a counterfeit document or a bullshit email, like we're, we're offloading all of this work onto users who probably don't really give that much of a crap and want to just go do their job anyway, because their boss is breathing down their neck. Yeah. And you hit on one of the points that I really like to make usually is that, you know, they have, they have to feel comfortable coming to you, asking questions or reporting something. They, they have to feel comfortable coming to your department or whoever it is. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's all futile anyways. Yeah. Um, I, I see a lot of like shaming based approaches to yeah. security education. And for some people, for a very small percentage of people, that actually works. I can think of a time in my career where I tried doing the proactive security education bit and it wasn't happening. So I did have to turn around and say, okay, how can I fish this team into compliance? Because they're not believing anything that I say, no matter how, what frame we put it in, how many cute cats we add to it. You know, it doesn't matter if we have their, you know, it doesn't matter if we revoke creds and don't let them into the repo they're supposed to be working on because they didn't set up the specific feature, like nothing happened. And sometimes you have to go the red team route, but that's not the way we should start out. We should start out at least giving people the chance to understand like, this is a bad idea and it's not going to be a good idea no matter what you do. But I don't know. I just, I think we're just not giving people a chance. Right. And the multi-factor authentication, which is number two, passwords is number one in our list of 10 things. 
uh, our top 10. Um, would 95% of all those phishing attacks that have the link to say, go log into your account here and, you know, uh, uh, download this file uh, for us or whatnot, it's going to break that, right? So we should be telling them, hey, use, um, use passwords with a password manager and use multi multi-factor authentication and provide them with multi-factor authentication in your own systems as a company that you build. Right. Yeah, a lot of the password advice that we see is really, really awful. Um, it tends to tell people they should change their passwords every six weeks. We've, we've seen that one dispelled a few different times in research. But then when it comes to the multi-factor authentication, like we already know from multiple huge technology companies that if you set it up and you have your two-factor there, account takeovers and all that nasty stuff actually decreases. And look, we have plenty of time to argue about S7 vulnerabilities and every other thing that makes multi-factor authentication suck or stuff that we can improve to make it a lot stronger, but it's an example of where we can take an incremental improvement and mm -hmm. we can actually use these things in combination to help our users not have to jump in and you know field every single weird email that comes in. I mean, if you have strong passwords, you have your multi-factor set up and you have something, um, I don't know, say you're able to have egress filtering or you just really aggressively scan for spam in your system, like that helps. That's that's more energy that your user doesn't have to actually spend trying to get their job done. We have a lot of technological stuff we can do from our side where we don't have to say like, oh, by the way, these are the situations where you want multi-factor authentication, choose wisely. We can just go in and set it up and yep. say, yeah, if you don't use it, you're not going to be able to get access to something. Or if you don't use it, you're going to be much more likely to have bad stuff happen. Instead of saying like, oh, this guy totally broke in and stole all these photos and like wipes this account clear. Aren't you so scared? Like, just tell people, hey, set this up. We don't have to scare you. Like, just get it going from the beginning and we can skate right on through and you can do what you need to do. <clears throat> yeah, there doesn't have to be a test on why multi-factor authentication and strong passwords are good. Just set it up and require it. The other thing that's really frustrating is sometimes um, I see this happen with well-meaning security people a lot. There will be a training session or there will be an awareness video that gets made in-house. And instead of talking about why something works, they talk about all the things that can go wrong. Because it's, it's a very security thing to do, right? Like we want to be transparent and we want to be honest all the time. The problem with that is we tend to start out with the bad stuff first. Mm. Yep. And that's also the stuff that is not very empowering to users. If the it's user that hacker feels, mentality we all have, right? Right. So if we start with that stuff and that's the opposite of what the user needs to hear to actually be successful at doing what we want them to do, how do we expect things to get better? If we give them a little bit of a rosy rosy glasses outlook, we can say like, hey, look, these hacker guys, they're great. They're smart. They're probably going to come and get us all, but you can actually be a few steps ahead of them if you just follow these basic rules instead of learning the entire universe of yep. information security threats and breach vectors and all the other crap that we as professionals need to have memorized. So it sounds like yeah, you, you become... want to keep the message positive versus negative. Yeah, you get, I mean, you get a lot more out of positive reinforcement. And I'd say like a lot of the corporate training videos I've had to sit through and watch, they're not positive <laughs> or negative. They're just there. Yeah. And if you have to pick a point of view or a side, like, yes, as an industry, we're struggling in some places and we're failing in other places, but everybody doesn't have to know that. We don't have to tell everybody what's wrong right up front all the time and then discourage them from being on our team. If we're just kind of like, yeah, come join our party. We're a little crazy. On Tuesdays, we get donuts. On Thursdays, we try to break into, you know, the CFO's business. That's fine too. It, it needs to be much more of a welcoming party. And we need to really be in a land grab to get everyone excited about what we do. Not the other way around. Requiring everyone to be an expert takes way too much energy. And our salespeople and our marketing people and all the other teams we work with really shouldn't have to become security people to do their job. It should be something that's so natural and we make it so easy. It's just a natural part of their job they're used to doing. 
So yeah. So for all of these these ten things you've mentioned here, how many of these could not necessarily be training, but just something that's put in by policy that you don't need to put training on? There's plenty of stuff. Um, I I would say in terms of it, it really depends on how you set up and you provision devices. If you're a small business of five to ten people, you might have to know how to do a whole bunch of security stuff by yourself and or you're going to have to call your neighbor who's really good at IT and who helps out once a month when you need to update stuff. That's reasonable. I would say though if you're able to structure things in groups in a group of 10 and just set up like guiding rules, that's fine. For passwords, you can just say, "You know what? Here's what we'd like to see, but actually use a password manager." Oh, by the way, when you're logging in, you definitely have to use the multi-factor thing. It's basically a second password that changes every 30 seconds. It's pretty cool. Try it out. Um, for things like safe browsing, you really need to train people and you have to do a lot of work in making sure that plugins are set up appropriately and people can navigate the, the ridiculous like ad blocking system that we have right now. We have ad blockers that block the ad blockers that also block the other blocking ad blockers or something like that. That's kind of hard. And people don't like following security rules if they don't know how to navigate through a specific task mm -hmm. when an obstacle gets thrown up in the way. Yeah. That's probably not going to work well for policy. But um, I don't know. A lot of what we can do, we can just set up rules in the beginning. Like, hey, if you're traveling and you have to charge your device, just bring your own cables. Don't use the thing at the hotel. Don't plug into some untrusted power brick that's in a department store or a bar. Like, just bring your own charging stuff. That yeah. removes so much energy and so much friction from the user thinking like, oh shit, I just need to go plug this in somewhere. Let me go somewhere now. Is that okay? Am I breaking policy? Is that that thing I learned in the 23rd module, you know, after the <laughs> moon of 1972? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So uh, would you, would you add here uh, egress filtering? Well, so I'm trying to figure out a number 10, but um, <laughs> let's, I would let's... say actually I have a number 10. So okay, let's do it. It's something that I don't like walking people through, but something I think is really necessary. We don't have any amazing education going on around backups. So I think mm. that, you know, we have all this ransomware crap happening. It's expensive to set up a team and to have a program that just manages backups. I get it. But at some point, um, we really need to have a conversation to where our users can say, hey, like, does my machine back up? Do I need to do that myself? Where does where does the stuff on my computer go if something happens to it? Like, am I going to have to go find some bitcoins, or what's up? Yeah. Um, so I'd say yeah. like, I don't usually go through backups because it's hard, right? Like, we want our people to back something up to a local device, and then we want them to back it up to the cloud. That's not stuff that the vast majority of consumers are going to be comfortable doing. Um, if you're looking from a small business perspective too, like that takes so much time. You're not going to probably be comfortable with a command line somewhere to set up all of these automated fancy things um, as often as you'd like to be. But at least from a small business perspective, if you have a good mind on your backups, you at least have business continuity going. If the only computer you ever use is your personal slash work computer, yeah. that can be the difference between being able to roll up to work on Monday or having to, you know, turn around and go and file for bankruptcy or shut your business down or, you know, lose a prospective client. Yeah. So for small and, and medium businesses and you're a Small for you is five to 10 employees and medium is what, 50, 50 employees? I, yeah, that sounds about right. I okay. consider a lot of the startups that I've worked for to be small businesses um, just based on like, I, I had been at one company, I was employee number three and another I was employee number four. So you're at the point where you have a couple of founders who are super technical, but don't want to make any rules and want everyone to feel comfortable. And when you get to the 50 to 100 range, you're probably making your first security hire mm -hmm. and you're probably starting to realize, oh shit, people are using their work devices as personal machines. We're getting a lot of malware from that. Yeah. So, okay. So in that vein, if they're making their first security hire at about 50 to say, let's say 75, would they be really caring about training that early on? Because it seems to me like the security would come first and then the security guy's like, well, you guys need to implement training. And then higher number 100 would be like, 
you know, we need to hire some people who can help us with the training part. It seems to me a lot of the small and medium businesses or people who are burning through VC like it's Shark Tank time just want to get their crap to to the market. And I put crap as being the, the stuff that they're trying to push to market. They're not really caring about stuff other than getting to market. The security stuff is, is all secondary. The, mar- the, 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 the training stuff is tertiary or even way down the line. It really depends on what your company is specifically building and doing and who it's for. If you're, you know, a really young um, tech company and you're going after enterprise customers and all enterprise customers care about is compliance, maybe it's not your first priority, but I would argue that the human factors and the culture factors are the ones that are the hardest to solve. Mm. So if you can start out with 10 things you want every employee to know, and they also happen to be 10 things that can help that employee, you know, level up or improve their personal security. That's yeah. much better than just waiting for three years until, you know, you have to hit a compliance goal or you hire a full team. Starting mm-hmm. out with your first 10 rules is especially if they're the passwords and the multi-factor and they're safe browsing things. Uh, that's going to help you out a lot more than when you're a bigger company and you have even more employees to chase down and track down and to solve problems with. Yeah. So whatever, whatever you do as a small or medium business to be smart, you also have to make sure that it scales appropriately because whatever works at five to 10 is not going to work necessarily for 50 to hundred. Yeah. And sometimes you also can look at different teams and how their ability to be secure and doing their work is going to impact whether your business can continue or be successful. I mean, if you're a tech company and you're trying to build a financial tool, but your finance department keeps losing all the money to phishing people, how the hell is anybody going to trust what your platform's actually doing? Mm -hmm. That's that's a really big problem. We don't usually find out which companies get phished and when until someone has a lot of hurt feelings and they write a really long blog about all of their Bitcoins getting stolen. That's yeah. happened probably 20 times in the past three years. Um, but <clears throat> I used to be rich and then I lost all my Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Sad panda. So um, one of the things late this afternoon that you hit me up with was uh, there was a ZDNet article. SANS came out with their security awareness study revealing, talking about technical communications. And I, I posted a little something from the, the article. I'll read it here. It says the report goes on to say security awareness professionals with more technical backgrounds are more keen to recognize behaviors that might bring risk. However, at times communicating training is critical given that human interaction soft skills make changing risky uh, employee behavior. They know what behaviors are most effective in managing those risks. However, the challenge is that these same individuals lack skills or training to effectively communicate those risks and engage employees in a manner that can effectively change behavior. So we get stuck in acronym hell because a lot of us come from military backgrounds. I know I come from military background where acronym hell is a thing. You know, uh-huh. you know, POC, GTFO, STFU, G, GW, you know, get back to work. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, GV, TW or whatever. Um, so we come from that kind of background for the majority of us. And, and for the other ones, they just kind of pick it up as they go along. We're mostly introverts. We make jokes that, yes, if you recognize me at DerbyCon, it's because I've got bows on my shoes or something. Uh, or we're talking to ferns. And, and this article is saying that we're not wanting to get out there to help train people or to teach people the, the necessary ways to do this. How do we get out from our own way so that we can make more effective strides towards proper training of people? I have a lot of opinions about this article. One of them is they say that, you know, the technical people are the ones who might be the best at security awareness positions. I actually think the best thing to do is to reach outside of the security team when you have an awareness or an education problem. The smartest people in your organization who know how to change behaviors and get ideas stuck in people's heads, probably going to be marketing and communication. It's (sighs) there. Shut it's their job. No, no, no. Seriously. That's, that's exactly. For a second. The marketing that's... team has to feed content to the sales team to get people to give them money. This is a behavior change for real. And if you think about the marketing crowd and the communications crowd, the reason that they're successful 
is they recognize that they have to be able to have a message and to make the point of that message resound in someone's head a bajillion different ways. You can't just say don't reuse passwords. You, if you're the marketing person, know that you have to say it the positive way five ways, the negative way three ways, and then the joke way two other ways for it to really stick across all of the different segments that you're looking at trying to reach. Those are the people that we need to be really making smart about security and borrowing their time and their expertise and their design skills and anything else we, we might need. Uh, to really get programs moving. Yeah, that's exactly who we worked with as our marketing department when we created our user education. Um, so, not only do my design skills suck, but uh, they were they, they were help, able to help not only with design, but with wording and um, best ways to get the information out there. Because it's not, not just, you know, the, the yearly monthly, whatever training that you're trying to put it out in, you're trying to put it out in other, other forms, whether it be like newsletters or company website or meetings, what, you know, what have you. So, so the, other- the, the people who are in most need of our security training are the people who are going to be helped to create our training. Yeah, totally. If we keep making security so hard that we can't bring other business partners in to help make it something that everyone cares about or at least pays attention to and maybe changes some bad behaviors for what a hope do we have of getting anybody else to do it Mm. if we can't actually partner with the people that we work with who share the same work culture and get a paycheck from the same place what even what is the point i mean if we start reaching across the aisle to those people and we start really looking at how we talk about the defensive side of security and make sure that everyone doesn't have to be an engineer to be successful there. Um, we might actually have a little bit more of a chance. Yeah, That's just me. I'm, I'm a little bit opinionated about this because I started out in the marketing and communication side of the house, but I have worked with thousands of people who don't work for a tech company. I've worked with kids. I've worked with teachers. I've worked with the old lady gang on my street. And I've found that it's really about being able to have the same idea and present it in multiple ways until it sticks. And the security team way of doing it doesn't necessarily help us out a whole bunch. Okay. So, so the, the, the recommendation from the study was take communications training. They can be easily developed with the right focus. Who is they? Are they trying to say that security people can be molded to change and become like the J streets of the, of the, of the organization who are outgoing and can, you know, socially engineer people into understanding training or what? I think they're trying to say that your security awareness person can be easily developed, but um, having been on the communication side of the house, that's not a skill that you just intuitively get after, you know, two days and an offsite course where you get fancy lunch. I have led gosh, countless security executives through media training. And some of them I've put through the same training 12 times. I've adapted the training every time to try to better fit the executive. But at the end of the day, if their nature is to be a little bit more closed and they think and PGPs and ZTRPs and 55 other, you know, crypto protocols, that's all you're going to get out of them. And I, I think that, you know, if we're trying to say, it's really easy to make people good communicators. We're probably missing the point a lot. We should yeah. be able we should be able to simplify the security part so we can get the smartest people we have in the marketing and the comms realm to help us with this work. It's a personality thing. I mean, you can't I mean, I don't know, maybe you can, but I I think it'd be hard to teach someone a new personality, right? Yeah. I mean, it would be like dancing with the stars security version. Do we really want to see everyone trying to like successfully entertainingly cha-cha across the floor? I don't know. I don't know. I see a man. I see a I man for one laughing. would like to see <laughs> no, 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 some of that. I'm, I'm laughing because Brian just threw a, cat, a towel at his cap that was meowing. <laughs> <laughs> she won't shut up. I she heard. Has, she has a lot of feelings. And Next to leave my shoe. She see. hears this and she's agreeing with Jesse and it's <laughs> She heard that the Fido Alliance Alliance was going to get some dogs and now she wants her own authentication protocol. Yes. Wait, didn't you have like two cats in there? You could have like multi-catter authentication, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. I think you're onto something. Yep. (laughs) 
so we could we could teach people we we can't necessarily teach security people how to change but can we teach users to change totally we just have to give our users an actual chance at being able to learn stuff i mean if you look at some of the most security critical tasks that we have that we put users up for like passwords are one of the few places that users actually get any say in their security. If you go to a website and I, I had to do this a lot recently because I moved and I went and I signed up for passwords. Like I'm okay with my password manager. I will regenerate a password until it stays. And 15 minutes later, I was ready to use like monkey as a password and to move the hell on. Mm. If I'm mad at it because I didn't get the rules in advance and it didn't make it easy for me and my tools to navigate through, like how the hell is any other person who doesn't know this is important going to have, you know, the stamina or the patience to actually get one word that works after yeah. they've been met with like the little red X's and the mad faces and like the, you broke the rule 50 times. <laughs> it, it's not going to happen. We have to really find out ways that we have to use ways and communications methods and content methods where we get people to laugh. We don't make them feel bad. We don't make them feel ashamed. We have to make sure that we're saying all the positive stuff security things can do before we say the negative stuff. And we absolutely have to not be so technical all the time. I mean, every time I see people arguing about secure communications methods, it's always, well, let's get in a fight about these protocols that we don't know anything about. The point's not really the protocol. It's what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to defend from. And you don't need to know the whole history of war and peace in the world and every universe that might have ever existed just to get through a task correctly. So if we simplify it, we make it a little bit funny. I don't know, maybe we have some more like pop culture fiction moments where we get a good laugh. We might give users a little bit of a chance, but I think right now, a lot of the, here are all the ways it fails before you even get started. It's not helping us at all. Okay. So it sounds like you're a big fan of creating training inside the company using what I would, I would assume employees as actors in your, in your, in, in your training. Um, would that be so a lot of the a lot of the issue that is people don't want to take the time to do that is it a lot less time intensive to do and how often do you have to do redo these things these these scripts and the and you know and, and your trainings i mean if you have to redo them every year you know what benefit do you get from from taking the time to do the training and you know the the actors and the scenarios and stuff in inside for the, everyone else I'm not necessarily a fan of doing things in video format or, or creating them in-house. I mean, what happens if you have five employees and then they all quit at the same time and move mm -hmm. to another company, but you're reusing the same training thing? That yeah. sucks. And we are seeing vendors who are coming up with like funny, thoughtful videos where they let a security team, you know, add in bullet points and things that comply with policy. That happens, but... What I think is actually most effective is keeping an eye out on pop culture stuff. Um, a lot of the best moments I've had, especially working with teachers, have been like finding a silly gift from the Kardashians where they got in a fight about, you know, breaking into someone's email account because they knew that they reused a password. It was about, you know, the time that somebody pissed off Kylie because they figured out she was geotagging tweets and that was a huge privacy problem. Stuff like that. Um, hmm. If Kim Kardashian knows that basically every dude on this planet reuses passwords, like that tells us something, especially when she makes a good joke out of it and everyone has a laugh on her TV show. I might not be like the biggest Kardashian fan, but I think it's really important to look at the pop culture moments where we can make a joke or we can use that moment as an analogy. Like I love watching Jurassic Park and making bad dinosaur security jokes. But right. sometimes it works. Sometimes it helps. If we can do more of that and take all of this crazy, abstract, super hard, like pie in the sky, ghosty stuff and make it actually real to people, I think that that really has a much bigger effect than some dude on a video just like reading you in slow words all of the rules of his people. Right. So, I mean, so for like example, you, you mentioned Jurassic Park. Are you talking like the original one with Wayne Knight being the insider threat? The like original, yes, that one. Oh yeah. my gosh, that one is so rich with security examples. I mean, for one, like if the billionaire spared no expense, 
why were there not separate gate systems? Because if one gate system failed, but the other gate system was like totally fancy and brand new and like a different manufacturer, great. Like the first one failed, but the second one works. Cool, no big deal. We have air gap systems that don't rely on each other. I also get really upset. Um, There's this one dinosaur terrarium scene in Jurassic World. And I just don't know who threat modeled the dinosaur terrarium because who puts in windows big enough that if broken, the flying dinosaurs can fly out of? Who did that? Like, where is the extra layer of defense? They don't make chicken wire that big. (laughs) They are giant (laughs) flying chickens, aren't they? But like some of them were little dinosaurs. So what if you had the big windows and then you had like the chicken wire exoskeleton? They would be stuck in. The dinosaurs would have to learn how to eat metal and fly through it and not get all scratched up. And you would your passwords would be way safer. (laughs) Then you wouldn't have a good movie. Yeah, I was gonna say I tell my wife this is Hollywood. They have to have a script, otherwise it's like twelve pages and nobody's gonna watch it. They have to have fails. They have to have fails. I mean, but that's the point, though. If they have to have fails, and we have all of these super expensive, fancy actors like prancing around and doing the fails for us, why not say, all right, I'm stealing this. This belongs in my curriculum. Or like, this is a totally important video. I can shoot out to my team of 20 people and say, oh my God, I watched this this weekend. It's so stupid. But it reminded me I should really get better at this specific security task. Right. It's you don't have to have like a program that's all written up in a giant 200 page book to be successful. It's really about being continuous and keeping the message going. And you might get to a point where if you find a funny piece of content or you every Friday make sure that you send out a security related email, other people chime in and other people start sending out silly stuff that they found too. So like take a small two minute clip of a lady running through a house away from Leatherface. And if she had just bothered to shut and lock the doors, maybe she would have survived. Totally. So don't allow piggybacking. Yeah, that's a really good one, actually. If she had just like been (laughs) smart and let the... No, that's not a good one. (laughs) No, that was awful. No, think about it, though. How many times in a movie has someone gotten in because they didn't lock a door or they totally knew that they could social engineer and like, you know, badge surf their way in. Yeah. Yeah. I I guess so. I'm just saying if your company has a culture where Leatherface is a thing, that's a great idea. If that doesn't work, you can totally go for any of those awful office comedies that we've all had to watch at some point. Right. And you can co-opt that too. Oh, yeah. yeah, like Mission Impossible. Well, it would have been impossible if the yes. correct security <laughs> protocols were in place, right? Totally. So, yeah, don't yeah, don't have I that winch above your your secret room where he can use that to repel yeah. them. Right. Get rid of that. Or or those uh, air vents that are like made of solid titanium, where you know people can crawl, can crawl through. through and, yeah. Yeah. Wait, no, didn't didn't without hard- collapsing. Didn't Target get hacked because someone crawled through the air vents? I'm really confused. Somebody, uh, sure. If you grease up, <laughs> if you grease up the HVAC tunnels, then people can't slide through them properly or something. You know, put some, yeah. you know, no skid yeah. or something. Yeah, and they can't plug in any USB things either. No. Yep. I saw some of those on Amazon. They have like um, they're little bitty clips that you can put inside the USB connectors and you have to have a special key to get them out. I don't know how effective they are, but I've hmm. never seen that before. I feel like there's probably really? someone with a magic key. Um, yeah. I tend to just favor my sync stop a lot and not really use a lot of USB things unless I have to. Mm. You never know when somebody intercepted your mail and like totally put in some malware infected nasty one. I'm just saying. Yep. So um, before That's we, why I don't read many of my email. Yeah, yeah. I don't either. If you no. don't read your email, you won't get fished. <laughs> yeah, mar- <laughs> marketing, marketing at whatever company I work for just goes to the round file folder all the time. So, yeah, <laughs> I probably should reach out to the marketing people now. Now I feel bad. So, help Actually, me with training. I once I had a team that didn't know that their security at wasn't working for two years. What? Wow. Yes, they kept wondering. What? They kept wondering why people were going full disclosure. And I was like, all right, well, I mean, there's no vulnerability disclosure policy. So like that doesn't help you, but also security at doesn't work. It bounces. Why would it bounce? Is your security so good that like you can't accept emails because they're broken or something? I just Mm. don't understand. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah. 
<clears throat> yeah, you got to make sure your uh, your your distribution lists work properly or it's spelled properly. I actually had a customer that spelled security wrong, so they you know they weren't getting oh. their emails. So it was like security at, and they forgot the 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 t at the end. So it, every time people would try to email them, they wouldn't get anything. <clears throat> well, you know, IT people, developers. They all write at an eighth grade uh, writing level. So you're part of the problem, sir, not part of the solution. <laughs> <laughs> so it tells me uh, the, the show notes tell me that you're writing a book. Yeah. Do, why are you writing a book? It seems like we, we've gotten a lot of authors on recently. So I'd say the first reason I decided I needed to write a book was kind of silly, but from the time that I read my first book as a four-year-old, I remember being like, all right, I got to write one of these. Um, I've been looking for something I cared enough to write about. Like I'm, I'm, I have no, I don't aspire to be like Jane Austen. That's not going to happen. I don't have any good sassy lady stories to tell, but I realized when I was poking around and learning about security, a lot of the books are super technical. Um, there are maybe a handful of really good security education books um, that will help you get a program started. But there's nothing that really talks about, like, drop the, drop the whole, like, we're at work and I have to teach you security stuff. There's nothing that really focuses on how we can get better at talking to human beings, whether, you know, they are kids or whether they, they're the old ladies down the street or they're the people that we work with day to day. Even, you know, if we're at a party that's not work related, we don't have good ways um, and really good models for figuring out what incentives people care about most and how we need to really focus on personalizing some of the security issues we're trying to solve so that our users care about changing their behavior. Um, so I realized this a while ago and I didn't want to write a book because I felt like everybody already knew this stuff. And after having to go to a bajillion conferences and having someone poke at me for a good like six or eight months via email, I said, all right, I'll do it. Fine. This will be like my one book I write. Um, I'm about 40% through it. So we'll see what happens. I might have a surprise ending. Who knows? But I felt like it was something that we could all benefit from. Mm -hmm. um, if we're able to really get people to understand that the technology we use isn't magic and they can be super smart and work hard to learn this stuff too, even if it's you know, walking their way through a security task, um, they can be part of team security too. Very nice. Okay. <clears throat> well, you know, um, if you need somebody to write a forward, I've, I've been turned down at least by one person, uh, who was writing a book recently, uh, who didn't, you know, hook me up with a, with a forward. So I'm hey, not Brian. naming names. Hey, Brian. Brian, you know what this is? <sighs> Yes, I am. Oh. Yes. Small violin. Yeah, it's a small violin playing sad song. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's fine. Just don't come to me for second edition, all right? You, you just all right. go all back right. to the same trough you, you pulled from. Wait a so. second, though. Wait a second. Doesn't second edition mean that first edition totally sold out, so they had to do a reprinting with some updates because it's that important? Like, wouldn't you want to be in the super important, like, next run of the book i don't i don't understand oh i i i, I wouldn't say no but apparently somebody's <laughs> already made that decision for me so oh they're, they're printed on demand so sorry <laughs> <laughs> and my next book my next book you'll be the forward it's gonna be a children's you know, it's whatever makes her more money apparently you just weren't uh profitable <laughs> oh god um, man hey, you saw who we had you saw who we had on the back cover yeah who was on the back that's cover? Some important people. Oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Jack Daniels and uh, uh, the Google security lady. Now that I can't remember her name. I, oh. I don't have the back page because I only have the electronic copy. There's a whole squad of Google security ladies. So we'll just pretend that it's the whole squad goal. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> All right. Pilot so Blue was coming to head my mind, but that's not who it is. All right, Selena so, Kyle. Oh yes. So Sorry. we are we are far over our one hour time limit, uh, sadly. Um, but I wanted to find out if you were going to be speaking anywhere, if you're going to be at any conferences or conventions that we can meet you at. 
Let me think about that. I have to do security summer camp this year. So I will definitely be around for Vegas stuff. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think, did I tell anyone I would give a talk? I don't remember. Okay. But I just got home from South Africa. I have a couple of things in San Francisco. Um, there's a lawyer panel. Apparently lawyers need to learn about encryption. And I am the person to help yeah. them figure yeah. that out. Right. So we'll see how that goes. But nothing until um, summer in Vegas. Okay. So. How was, how was South Africa? Um, it was totally amazing. So first of all, I have to say I did the tourist thing and I went on a safari and it was the coolest thing ever. And I won't shut up about giraffes and wildebeests and lions <laughs> and stuff. I've already planned my next trip. Um, but the conference that I went to was an IT web security summit. It was a beautiful conference. All of the cool vendors that we actually like were there, which was really nice. But it was really cool talking to people who are in a developing economy, who are putting money and they're putting a lot of effort and work into building their own technology industry. I'm hoping that by a lot of us making the effort to reach out to the more emerging economies, we can just have them skip like whole classes of failure that we've been through and uh, make them not repeat the same mistakes. Sure. Um, so that was that was pretty interesting. Plus, there are a lot of really smart people and. I learned that South African people absolutely have a section on every menu that is a grill. So there was steak, there was ostrich, there were chicken livers. I did not partake, but everything was a grill and everything was delicious. And I even found tacos, but I did not eat the ostrich tacos. Why not? It's like big chicken, right? I mean, I just, I was hoping that I got to see an ostrich when I did the safari thing. And I figured if I ate it before I went on the safari, it might like attack me or like peck me to death for like eating its cousin. Karma. Yeah. 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 I hear you can ride them. Yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There was a joint up here in Seattle that had like ostrich and camel races. Oh my God. There is a, there is a comedian. Oh, go ahead. Down in San Diego, they have ostrich farms that sell uh, ostriches for an emu for, for meat. Um, Um, but yeah, you can you can race them. They do races. They they have saddles and stuff, and they they ride. What? Them. Yeah. Oh my god. Won't they? Won't they turn their head around and just peck your face off? No, they're very scared. I'm gonna just well, pretend they're dinosaurs, and like if I can do this in South Africa and be all Mad Max about it, that's that's my best life. Yeah, I mean, it, it, hopefully they keep running in the opposite direction. If you fall off, because if you turn around, they could disembowel you. But um, yeah, oh. you know, they're they got claws. You know, like. Um, i really think we should just get everyone together and have a safari con of like the smart fun people uh, and like just go see the animals and hang out and i don't know like we just do our security talks at night around the dinner table or something to the to the roar of lions on the in the serengeti that would be amazing totally i've wanted to go to kenya i always thought it was a a nice place to be so bob and tom sounds like morning (laughs) zoo stuff um (laughs) Anyway, so listen to that later. You're going to be about, at uh, summer enough. summer camp. Are you going to Derby Con or anything? Because I'm, I'm trying to do a segue here. Oh, I hadn't planned on going to Derby Con. I missed the tickets because I was out of the country. Well, I'm glad you said something because <laughs> we actually have some tickets that we're planning on giving away uh, on our show here. Uh, we have th- Two tickets, uh, po- possibly three, if Miss uh, if Miss Berlin gets her talk accepted at DerbyCon, she assures me, wank wank, that that's going to happen. It's totally, <laughs> totally going to get she accepted. She knows. She knows a guy who knows who knows a guy. So uh, I, yes, yeah, right. So we've got three tickets that we're going to give away. Uh, we're we're currently in the planning stage for our CTF. Uh, we're also going to do a, an auction. We're probably going to give that away to some kind of charity, international or otherwise. Uh, and then the third one, we're just going to, we're going to figure out what we're going to do with that. Either we're going to do another auction or something and, and give that away. Uh, cause Mr. Betcher and I both have training. We're going to be at uh, various trainings there for Derby Con, So we all get tickets for that. So, um, so yeah, if you want to try to get a ticket for Derby Con, you can, you know, join our CTF like we did last year. Uh, we're going to be doing some different stages. Mr. Betcher's working on some stuff. We've got uh, Tyler Hudak, who's going to be helping us with some uh, some binaries and some malware type uh, type escapades. Um, we got some OSINT stuff that Miss Berlin's working on. Uh, I'm going to just 
I'm gonna do something. I, I don't know what I'm gonna do yet. It's probably gonna you can help me with all the O's and stuff I have to oh, create. Okay, I can try that. Yeah. <laughs> Are you? I I feel like he's dreaming up some sort of like stunt hacking no. contest. No. no, no, it's no. not that. Okay. No, no. Okay, I just I just had a social engineer in check. So yeah. no, we don't. I don't do... have any good stunt hacks right now. We're not gonna make we're not gonna make people jackpot ATMs or make. You Ooh, know, wait a minute. <laughs> or traffic lights change or anything like that. Uh, but we're we're just going to try to, you know, make make it fun and it's a free ticket. So if you win, you get it. Um so yeah, that's it. So uh if people uh, outside of hacker summer camp wanted to contact you, how would they go about doing so? The easiest way, I'm I'm most responsive on Twitter unless my quality filter is a jerk and then I apologize in advance, but I have open DMs. Okay. My email is basically a trash fire. So if it's an emergency, don't do that one ever at all. <laughs> okay. Tra- um, at trash fire is not good. Okay. Yeah, not good. Um, I have to say as much of a pain in the butt as some of the encrypted comms can be, I have no problem if someone wants to figure out how to use Signal, um, grabbing a burner device and talking through there. But they have really good docs. And please don't send me PGP stuff ever. It's just not happening. I think I lost my key. So, okay. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we, you know, we, we tell people that uh, we'd love to have them back on. And we really mean that. So if you have any other content or topic you'd like to discuss with us uh, from a leadership or training uh, perspective, we'd, uh, we'd love to see, it, uh, see you on. And maybe when you finish your book, we'll have you on as well. Next time I get feelings. Totally. Okay. Right on. Totally. I, I have a lot of feelings though. And if somebody comes up with some more like ugly password rules, I don't know. That'll happen like next week. We'll see. Purple monkey dishwasher is still my favorite, by the way. Mr. Horse oh, battery okay. staple. Yeah, that's a staple. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Betcher, you've uh you've been stoic for the last five or ten minutes here. How would people get a hold of you if they wanted to discuss malware or training or you know log MD? Well, they can just hit the malware Slack channel that you have. Ooh. That would be a good place. How would okay? Oh. Since you've pushed that uh, that button, go ahead and mention the Slack channel, please. I well, I thought that. I did. Right? There is one. How there would people sign up for said Slack channel? Killing me, dog. What do you mean? How do, how would people get to it if they wanted to sign up for it? <laughs> this is the test. Break set dot sign up dot team that's right https what are you, what are you testing me or something yes, come on yes i am yes i am because well, you're I almost have. zero times a day you guys are fancier than i am i have a slack but you just have to dm me and be nice to get in oh wait yeah. do, do <laughs> we nice. all have slacks are we communicating with other people through slacks instead of email and twitter oh yeah and bird signals well people oh, are yeah. trying that mastodon thing but i'm i'm just not in on i gave up on it I, I, yeah, I can't even. I mean, I'm sorry. The Raptors ate the mastodon in my department. It, oh, it's not happening. Well, okay then. It was. I mean, it was a novel idea. Yeah. That's yeah. Kind of... <laughs> it's it's another niche thing, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Sign, break to seg dot sign up dot team. Uh, Mr. Betcher, uh, Twitter. What's your Twitter? At Betcher Pwned. At Betcher Pwned. And. and... And my website, log-md.com, logmd. All right. Uh, Miss Berlin, uh, last but not least, how would people get a hold of you? My turn. Um, On Twitter, mostly, or on our Slack channel, uh, at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R. All that's in your book, right? So if they just buy the book, they can get a hold of you. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Book's doing well still. I'm, I'm just assuming everybody that listens to our podcast already has a copy. Uh, or you, you know, sold that many, huh? Wow. Um, we're Sam. up. We're up almost over two thousand. No, nice. it's been a month. That's awesome. A little bit over a month. Yeah. Very cool. We're like Oprah. Yeah, we you. we do like a, a we got the bump. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> like it's, you got you got the book club thing going on. Yeah. Right. yeah. I need like the little approved by sticker. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we did the, the Eurozone. Oh we did the Eurozone book club today uh, at noon Pacific time. It was 1900 UTC. So uh, we had uh, about three, four people on talking about uh, chapter 10, which was about windows infrastructure. We didn't get through the whole chapter. Uh, we do have a U.S. Ber- version, which happens on Monday nights, but, uh, you know, the Eurozone people can't get to the, win- the Monday night one. So we have one during the U.S. workday. 
Um, so we have some people on for that. So if you're in, in Europe and you want to join a book club, uh, we have one running. So it's on our Slack. We also have channels for malware and reverse engineering. We have a job board. Uh, our CTF club was supposed to be going on right now, but because of the way s that Zoom is set up, you can't run two different web conferences on Rude. the same account. So I screwed just the found that out. I screwed the pooch on the CTF club tonight. So I'm sorry, gentlemen, oh. ladies, for for that. Oops. Yes, I know. So it's I'm assuming it's not the same link then. No, we it's not the have, same. Like, a it's, a, bunch of it's a different oh, link. Yeah. But all they yeah. got was, hey, Brian's already in another one. Oh, you can't run no. this at the same time. So I may nice. end up having to get two accounts or something just in case we double book ourselves. So um, upcoming training. So we had such a great time with Matt. We're actually doing another training. Miss Sunny Ware, who I found out is apparently on Plural Site, and she does stuff with Cyber. She's uber serious uh, training person. She does a really great job. So she's going to be doing a web application security, um, basically uh, how to detect and prevent OWASP related uh, web vulnerabilities. She's going to do three sessions with us uh, starting on 14 June. The next one is 21 June and 28 June. Those are all Wednesday nights at 1900 Eastern Time. That's 7 p.m., which is 4 o'clock Pacific and 2300 UTC. Uh, the way you do that uh, and attend the class is you go to our Patreon, which is in our show notes, or patreon.com forward slash BDS underscore podcast. Sign up at the $20 level and you will be uh, have a seat in the class. Uh, if you can't attend the class because of time zones or what have you, we'll, uh, we'll have video available. And what you'll do is uh, pay $9 and you'll be able to follow along with the, the class like right after we get done with the class. The videos will become available to you at the $9 level. Um, you'll also get a lovely tote bag and a director's chair. I sound like PBS right here, man. I, I don't know what's going on. If you sign up at the $30 level, you'll get a brand new album. Yeah. So, but if you don't want to do any of that, you'll just wait a week after the class is done and we'll just release all the videos for free. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's a, it's going to be a great class. I've looked at her slides. She's doing a really fantastic job. So if you want to, you know, sign up for that, uh, you know, there'll be a, a information in our show notes. So, we got a lot going on. I mean, we're all over the place. So iTunes, Google Play, tell your friends because uh, word of mouth advertising is very good. We have about 400 people in our general chat and it's very active. So if you're looking to do some networking as well, uh, join us up on our Slack. So uh, uh, official Twitter is at BreakSec. I'm at Brian Break, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. And uh, I think we're done for the week. Uh, so uh, thank you, Miss Jesse, for coming on again. It was uh, it was a lot of fun. I'm glad to finally have you on our show. Uh, you're somebody I've been following for a very long time, and uh, it's well worth the uh, well worth the time. So that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, right on. So um, all that stalking paid off. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but the question is, have you learned how to make a sign bunny? A sign bunny. If you follow my Twitter, you are aware of the sign bunnies. Uh, the sign bunnies. The sign bunnies are sassy, and they tell you how to do stuff. Okay, I will definitely have to put that as a filter or something. So when the sign bunny comes up, I'll be. Uh, I'll I haven't done any of them lately. I'm kind of so. I I'm just so did. full of feel. It's been a little bit. I think I had a couple right. sassy ones about generally not sucking at security, but I've done like a few hundred of them, and I have a tiny army of security bunnies coming after me in my dreams. It's, oh. it's terrifying. <laughs> But the ask yard is, is very lovely. It's very nice. So. Yeah, those are my bunnies. That's yep. my that's my crew. Okay. You have to learn how to make one. You should make one for the show notes. I'm just I, saying. I will I will give it my best effort. I don't do ask yard. So I just you assumed can... we copied and pasted off of one of your tweet. Exactly. <laughs> I'll just do that. Like, is it really difficult? I'll just do that. That's, yeah. that's exactly exactly how I do it. I had a smart uh, friend. I had a smart friend um, who was very good at the viral stuff. Mm -hmm. She created that sign bunny, and I was like, I'm gonna steal it, and I'm not gonna post about Taylor Swift when I'm when I'm making bunny signs. Yeah. And it's been way too much fun. But I start. I've noticed lately, like. Some of the saltiest people we have in InfoSec are also using the bunny. Uh, so oh. I don't know if I've done something good or bad because sometimes the bunny gets like really, I get kind of scared of it. Naughty. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not going to use it then because uh, the things that I would put in the sign would probably scare more, more people as yeah, well. Yeah. Don't be mean. Don't be cruel. Yeah. Nope. 
I was already mean. I was already mean today on Twitter. <laughs> I don't need to do it anymore. <laughs> I, I have it. to be I have to be careful on Twitter sometimes because I don't want to be mean, but I see someone like someone will come up with the worst thing they could possibly put in my mentions. Like I hate it when people generally call users idiots. Like I get it. Yeah. Not everyone a thousand percent understands, but like talking shit about users doesn't make us better at our jobs. And it sure as hell doesn't help us build better relationships with them. It shows yeah. like a huge empathy problem. So people show up in my mentions and they start talking shit about users or how stupid stuff is. And I'm like, somebody hold my beer. I got to get my Raptor on. Like mm. I, I have to go fight with this person on the internet. And like, I could be five minutes away from giving a keynote. I could be two minutes away from dialing into some stupid, important business call. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, hold on. I'm going to be late. Somebody's being a jerk and I can't stand it. Was there a lack of empathy there with the stupid business call? No, generally nah. my business calls are way too much fun to be serious. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's let's end this on a high note. Mr. Betcher, uh, have safe travels on your uh, your trip to the Grand Canyon and take pictures and, uh, you know, watch out for your personal safety uh, and your OPSEC. OK, I'll try not to fall off a cliff. <laughs> yes, please. Please don't do that. Your wife would miss you and I would miss you. So. I would miss you as well. Wow. Oh. She didn't oh, wait. She thanks. didn't hesitate. Notice there was no hesitation there. Yeah. So that's, that's that's true. That's real. So. All right, well, everybody. Have a, have a great week. Uh, breaking down security is out. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.